Well, we uh, introduced last time a discussion about the scripture being fulfilled, which is something that John says in his gospel when he's talking about the fact that things that were written in the Old Testament were things that were looking ahead in time and waiting for something else to come, which is, according to the Gospels, Jesus. And so I wanted to look at some of the things that are captured there that that they said were part of this and understand how they are part of this. You know, look back at those passages and see what what's that like, what's that about. And what we find out when we do that is that sometimes those references are a lot more um, indirect than we might have supposed. You know, they maybe aren't talking about very specifically some individual at some point in time. And so we have to come to understand what the passages mean in the first place to understand the the pattern, um, you know, or the story, the framework that they represent that Jesus is fulfilling. And John 19 was an example that I had of this in the 30th through the 37th verses is the record of the death of Jesus on the cross. And this is an example of some references that are uh, what I would call indirect, if you will. They're, they're not explicitly saying something about the time when the Christ will come, and they're not, they're not worded that way. And the two passages that John talks about are that he had no broken bones at his death and that he was confirmed to be dead by piercing. They pierced him and uh, examined to see what was going to be the outcome of that. And uh, we looked last week at no broken bones and determined that that had come from the Exodus from the Passover and examined that passage and related passages to see why John would say that the death of Jesus with no broken bones is a fulfillment of what had been written about Passover. So today we're looking at why the death of Jesus and his piercing is a confirmation or a fulfillment of what was written And it's in Zechariah that these things are written, actually. So we'll be going there eventually. But the account of the death of Jesus is John 19, 30 to 37, which I won't read at the moment, but um, this is the place where the 34th verse records one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. They came around to see whether the victims were dead, and two were not, and one was. Jesus was dead, and the piercing of the side is the confirmation of his death. Um, If by any chance he wasn't dead, he certainly is now, because this piercing of the side is actually putting the uh, sword or the spear up uh, the rib cage, you know, to, to pierce the heart. So they're making sure that people did not survive, although there was really no way they were going to survive long term anyway. But um, John explicitly tells us that these things that happened were prophesied and that they were fulfilled. At the 36th verse, these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. And at the 37th verse, one of the things that is fulfilled is they will look on him whom they have pierced. And we said last time, and we will repeat, that John is inspired by the Holy Spirit. John is writing the truth of God, the word of God in this gospel. So when he says that these passages 
refer to the death of Christ. He is correct about that. We have to come to understand them. So Zechariah 12 is the place where it says, they look on me on him whom they have pierced. And that's where we're going. Without further ado. So Zechariah is a prophet. Um, he is prophesying uh, at a time when uh, Judah is on its own. You know, Israel is no more. The, the majority of the people, the ten tribes that represented Israel, were carried off in captivity by Assyria years before. Now you have only the tribe of Judah and half of Benjamin, or whatever, the remnant of Benjamin, left in the land, and they are facing the destruction, uh, or have faced the destruction of Babylon. And they are now um, in captivity. This Zechariah is prophesying it somewhere around the time that it's being re-established and rebuilt, but it's not done yet. Um, so to understand this now is a message to people who have seen uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, their, their tribe. They've seen the destruction of this place. They've been displaced. Some are going back. It's being reestablished. That's the time when Zechariah says the things that he does in the 12th chapter. And this is where we start to wonder, how then is it like the crucifixion um, in the look on the one whom they've pierced? So first we need to understand what Zechariah 12 is actually saying. And um, the specific quotation is from Zechariah 12 and verse 10. The meaning of that verse is that the people have betrayed God and they know it. They realize that they've betrayed God and they feel a genuine remorse, a real regret about having done this. They're, you know, pierced to the heart, if you'll pardon the pun. But this is about betrayal and regret, that the people come to realize that they betrayed God, and they're genuinely sorry for that. They, that's the meaning of it when it first appears in the 10th verse. And this is very much like the one who betrayed Jesus. Uh, Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, is recorded in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4, uh, to have changed his mind after he saw what was happening to Jesus. And he went back to the, um, to the priests uh, and gave them the money, the back the money that they had hired him with they, he gave it back to them and said i've betrayed i've sinned i've betrayed innocent blood so he also was able to realize he betrayed god and to feel this terrible regret about it his response to that was not the right response but this is the the same kind of uh it's the same kind of thing that's happening that you come to realize afterwards what you have done and you have a genuine sadness about that, a desire to be reconciled to God. So I would say the context is Zechariah 12, about verse 5 through about verse 10. Um, you know, you could probably break it differently, but that's kind of where I'm going with this. Is I would say these are the ones that you need to look at closely to understand what's being said. And the first point is that of these passages, I'm going to explain this in overview, and, and then I'll give you specifics here, but the first point is that Judah returns to Jerusalem. That's the first thing that has to be established in these verses. It, you know, Judah realizes that God is doing something, that God is the one who's making Jerusalem come back. That, you know, it's not their own power. They couldn't have done this. They are in the process of removing the nations and displacing them and getting back to that homeland. And salvation is indeed for them first. It starts with them, with Judah. 
Um, the next thing that he talks about is this Jerusalem that they establish or reestablish. You know, once they get there, the citizens of Jerusalem are now as strong as David, which is an upgrade, you know. <laughs> and the house of David is like God, the angel of the Lord is what it says. That's an upgrade too. And I dare say a prophecy. <laughs> There's someone else who's of the house of David who is like God, an angel of the Lord to us in the new Jerusalem. But it's also the case for Jerusalem that God protects them from the nations that are around them. The third thing, then, is the verse in question where God pours out a spirit of grace and mercy. It's saying that God is turning their hearts back to himself. It's in that verse that they look on God as in they see what they've done. Then they realize that they have pierced him, and they mourn sad about having done this. That's the meaning. So um, I'm getting, you know, out of verse 5, where it says, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts their God. This is where they realize that the strength is from God. It's not from themselves. Something is happening in Jerusalem. Something's happening in Judah. And at verse 6, it said that they would uh, devour all surrounding peoples or nations while Jerusalem will again be inhabited in its place. So they're you know, displacing the nations and reestablishing Jerusalem and going back, right? And it, it's at the eighth verse where the Lord said he would defend them on all sides. And that day the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem And in part, he protects them, and in part, they are protected because they are now stronger than they used to be. This new Jerusalem, reestablished, rebuilt, is situated or is strengthened by God such that in the eighth verse, the feeblest among them on that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem in verse 9. So, again, you know, Jesus is the son of David, remember. But they're stronger than they were before. This is stronger than the first Jerusalem was. And now, you know, looking again at the 10th verse in a little more slow motion. And finally, I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. If you allow me to backtrack for a moment, the Lord is pouring out a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. And that is the way that God is working in the Lord. Jesus came for salvation, right? John 1 said that, that uh, grace and truth are come or known through Jesus. And it's in this verse, too, that God said, they will look on me. After, you know, they come back to Jerusalem and they're stronger than they were before then, they look on me. On him whom they've pierced, it's God who has been betrayed, is the meaning of that. And they'll mourn for him. Suddenly it goes into third person. Okay, that's fine. I mean, we understand poetry, right? But it's also the case <laughs> that the third person is compared to an only child, a firstborn. Who do you think that that is? Right? John is telling you who that is. It's the Son of God. It's Jesus. He is the only child of God. He is the firstborn. He's the one who has been betrayed to his death. And, you know, the, the death of a child is always a horrible thing. I can't imagine the, an only child. You know, that's got to be devastating. 
And that's the kind of mourning, the kind of realization. He said it's going to be like that when people realize that they betrayed me. So again, the passage is saying God will stand up Jerusalem. It will be clear that Jerusalem stands because God has made it to stand. It's his power. Secondly, the people will come to realize what they have done, that they betrayed him. They were the reason why it was destroyed in the first place. And they'll regret it. And finally, he will forgive and he will restore them. That's the meaning in the original passage. Zechariah 12, just all by itself, that's clearly what he's saying. But John is also clearly making an application to us that we would come to realize that we betrayed Jesus. And the death that occurred occurred because of us, because of our choices. And we would, those of us who are Judah, those of us who are interested, concerned about God, would regret that and be sorry for what we did. That's what John is saying. So looking on him, whom we have pierced, is realizing what we've done. That's what that is. We realize what we have done. It had to hit the apostles very hard when they realized he is dead. They had just betrayed him. Each one of them individually had just betrayed him, not stood by his side at his mock trial and crucifixion. In addition to all the things that all of us have done that are the sins that need to be atoned by the sacrifice of Jesus. So that had to hit hard when they realized, no, he's dead. And What have we done? That's where John's coming from when he quotes it this way. And it's the the meaning. And there's lots of records of this, and I wanted to grab them fairly quickly in the book of the Acts and in 1 Timothy because um, we'll, we'll focus on Paul there at the end. But one of the first places after the resurrection of Jesus, when he first sends the apostles and the you know the keys to the kingdom open the gates you know the the kingdom of god is here the church is here is acts chapter 2 oops and this is the time when they first begin to proclaim that jesus is the Lord's anointed, and that Jesus was prophesied to be raised from the dead. You know, there in Acts 2, 34 and 35, there's the quotation from the Psalms um, referring back to one where, you know, the, the servant of the Lord would not undergo decay. And David clearly is not talking about himself because he certainly did undergo decay. He's talking about somebody else, and that has to be Jesus, who did not undergo decay. He was resurrected, and he is alive. That's what they're telling him. And it, you know, Peter's words conclude at the 36th verse of Acts 2, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ Whom? This Jesus, whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles' brothers, What shall we do? So, we crucified him. When we say we betrayed him, well, we we were responsible for that. He was crucified while we looked on. There was not somebody who stood by his side. And these people were cut to the heart, which I take to mean that they realized it was true. They saw what they had done and came to realize what they had done. 
in the third chapter when they're preaching on another day. In the 13th verse, he said, the God of Abraham, this is still Peter though, but he said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy One and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you instead, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are the witnesses. So we killed, as he said, the Holy One, the Righteous One. We killed, at verse 15 of Acts 3, the author of life. Pilate had decided to release him, but we wouldn't let it be. And in the 17th, he said, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. And that's amazing, Acts 3.17. It's true. It's true. We did act in ignorance. We didn't realize what we were doing. We didn't realize what it meant, what the cost was, whom we were hurting. We didn't know. And God knows that we didn't know. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. Repent, therefore, and turn back so that your sins may be blotted out which is very similar to what he had told them when they asked what to do in Acts 2. Remember in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. But yes, he said, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance. And that is an important thing. The people of Judah did not understand perhaps what was going on. But when they came to see it, then they regretted it. And that's the theme. We who come to see it, and regret what we have done. We are the ones whom God is, is reaching out to, whom God is calling to repentance, to obedience, to become his children. In Acts 13, we have Paul speaking now. And a large crowd has gathered And he addresses them at some length. But I'll pick up the 26th verse of Acts 13. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, down to the 31. And those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they'd carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. But did you catch what he said there? They didn't recognize him. They didn't understand the utterances of the prophets. And this is why they fulfilled the utterances of the prophets by condemning him. That's what we did. We didn't recognize him. And because we didn't recognize him, he died. In Acts 17, Paul again enters a synagogue, as is his custom. In the first three verses there, and it says in the second verse, it's a synagogue of the Jews. And in the second verse, he three Sabbaths in a row, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying to them, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, he is the Christ. He is the Lord's anointed. Explaining and proving to the synagogue. What is this? Well, it's Judah. 
And they have to come back to the real Jerusalem, you see. They have to look on him whom they've pierced. And he's explaining it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, which is to say his betrayal, his death at our hands was requirement because the scriptures said it was going to be that way. It had to be so. We didn't understand. We needed it to be explained to us. We needed it to be proven from the scriptures. We needed to be convicted by the Holy Spirit through his word. And over in 1 Timothy, you can read these words from Paul about himself, which I think are very important words. Maybe should get more airtime than they do, but it's 1 Timothy 1, and it's verses 12 through 17. Paul said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. And if you're not familiar with the account of what Paul was like before he became a Christian, he was engaged in persecuting Christians. He was the chief officer sent to arrest them. He imprisoned them. He tortured them. He tried to get them to renounce the faith in Jesus. That's what he was like before he realized the truth, before he looked on him whom he had pierced and mourned. But I received mercy, he says, 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He received mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. It's like what we read earlier. He said, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. It's true. We didn't know. And the 15th verse continues, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. This saying Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Well, that's an interesting thing to say, but it's true. Doesn't get a lot worse than persecuting the Son of God at his crucifixion. Because Paul was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, yes, but he was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. He was there when all this took place. And to betray Christians to their death, to torture them, to separate them, to compel them to blaspheme, all these things he was doing, those are pretty bad. He really believed that he was right and the whole world was wrong, that he knew and nobody else knew, that he was the avenger, the one who would bring justice, the strong one. He really believed all these things, and it was completely wrong. That's why he says what he does. Jesus came to save the sinner, and I'm the chief of the sinners. You think you're bad. Look at what Paul did. That's what he's saying. Why? Well, I receive mercy for this reason, verse 16, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example for those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Yes, Paul was the foremost of the sinners. He was the one persecuting them. Remember in Acts 9, when Jesus appears to him from heaven, he says to him, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? So he has to reckon with that. And at that time, Jesus could have struck him, could have squashed him like a bug. 
And I dare say any of us, you know, who had been treated like that, who had been crucified by that man, who'd been jeered in the crowd, that man was in the crowd of people jeering us when we died in utter agony, and watched him do the same to our followers, our children, I dare say we would be minded to get a little vengeance, because we're human, (laughs) but God is better than us. Jesus displayed his perfect patience by forgiving Paul. Not without repentance. He wasn't saved when Jesus appeared to him. He was blind for three days, and a Christian came to get him, and then he got up and he was baptized, which is what Ananias told him to do in Acts 22.16. What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, washing away your sins and calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Paul did. In Paul, Jesus displays his perfect patience. It's an example for everyone who would believe in him for eternal life. We can be saved. God has patience for us. You know, that's what's coming. And in that 17th verse, he said to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. What is it? It's what Zechariah said. I will pour out a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. I hope that these things are very clear in your mind. You can see how what Zechariah said, the the figure that he set up, very clearly refers to this. We all have to come to realize what we have done. And though we acted ignorantly before, now we're confronted with the truth. And when that happens, it's not so that God can strike us down. It's so that we can repent. Yes, the conclusion of Zechariah in the 13th chapter is this one verse on that day. They who are mourning are followed by this. On that day, there will be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Yes, there is a fountain free. It is for you and me. There is a fountain opened on that day. What day? The day when they look on him whom they have pierced. That fountain fountain is the blood of Jesus shed as the sacrificial lamb so that we could have forgiveness. That's the blood that washes away our sins. That is the means by which he has shown us his mercy. And we can be cleansed from sin and from uncleanness. When we are confronted with the wrong that we have done, We have to respond to that. Those in Acts chapter 2 who received his word were baptized. And that very day they were added to the number of those who were being saved. Saul, as we talked about and alluded to in Acts 9, had to think very long and hard about what he had done. It took him three days to get up and move forward, put one foot in front of the other which you can understand. But whatever the case might be, whether in long or in short, the desire is that you become a Christian, you become a child of God, that you obtain forgiveness of sins. Not my desire, although it's true, I would love for you to be saved. It's God's desire. It's God who calls you. It's God who commands these things. It's God who's been wronged by the bad choices, the wrong choices, albeit ignorant. And it's God with whom you got to be reconciled. But God is way better than we are. He seeks mercy. He says, I desire mercy and not judgment. He seeks mercy. 
and he is forgiving, and you can be forgiven. You can become a different person. If you will look on him whom you have pierced, and you will mourn, then there is a fountain open for you to cleanse you from sin. We have water here prepared that you can be baptized in the name of Jesus, if you have not done this already, to become his child. Today, if you are a Christian, but have sinned in some way, repent. Turn back to God. He will forgive. He is merciful. And let us pray with you and for you to, for your restoration, that we might strengthen one another. But yes, when John said these things, he was tapping into a very large picture there. But it's a very good picture. That God is merciful. God is powerful. He restores and he brings us to the brink. We realize what we have done. But he does that so that he can reconcile us, so that he can cleanse us. If you will respond to his call, please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected. <laughs>